There we go. Okay. So hi. Hi. To start off with, would you like to say your name and where you are right now? Yes, my name is Stephanie Goldsmith. I'm a clinical psychologist and I am currently in Claremont, California, which is a city that is in the eastern part of Los Angeles County. Ooh. Okay, and we've established that it is not on fire currently. Right? It is currently not on fire, but the day is young. Okay, okay. Wow. Okay, we were in the so, middle of, it, the interviews in the middle of California, kind of fire season, so it's... Yeah, it's in the middle of fire season, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of the Trump presidency. It's, it's an interesting time. Everything, everything's on fire, <laughs> so... Yeah. So the first question for you, and this is, this is where it gets interesting because we've never met, so I'm very curious. Um, who are you? Who are you as a person, as a human being? Um, your values, passions, qualities, whatever you'd like to say about yourself? It's a big question. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's, do I go professional? Do I go personal? And I think all of those things are really you know, valuable that make up who we are. Um, you know, professionally, I'm a, a psychologist. I love what I do. Um, I don't feel like I work when I go to work. I feel like I'm doing something that um, gives me breath. <laughs> You know, um, I often feel energized at the end of my clinical day, which is a really nice, a nice feeling. Um, I have a group practice here in Claremont. Uh, so I have some people that I, I, um, I just, one of my associates just became licensed. So I have a, another licensed staff member and everybody else are, are training. So I do some supervision. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at Loma Linda University, which I really enjoy. So there's something for me in the uh, kind of nurturing and mentorship of new therapists coming up. I, I was really fortunate to have really great mentorship myself. So I, I get this real um, energy and nourishment from that kind of paying forward and, and, and training and supervising here in my, in my group practice. So obviously Gestalt therapist, I got my certification last year. I'm really excited. Probably one of the, one of the most exciting things I've done for myself was going through that process. Um, yeah. And as and, a person? And as a person, I, I like a lot of things, <laughs> so I think I really get a kick out of life. I, I really like to try new things. Um, I'm okay being a little bit uncomfortable trying something new that maybe I'll look a little silly doing or feel a little uncomfortable doing. I, I, um, I like trying things, even if I'm not good at them. But currently, not during the pandemic, but currently <laughs> one of my loves are obstacle races. Um, we have something out here called the Tough Mudder. It is international, so it's in other countries too, but they're about 10 mile obstacle races in the mud and they're super fun. And it's just <laughs> watching your face. Okay. <laughs> <It's fun. laughs> well, because I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, okay, everybody's comfort zones sort of ends in a very different place. And I'm, I was wondering what yours, okay, yeah, 10 mile muddy obstacle races. That's cool. My four-year-old would be right behind you on that. He'd love that. <laughs> We've actually, um, I think you can do the mini mutter when you're five and I have a five-year-old. I have two boys and oh. um, my five-year-old, we've, we've been doing virtual Tough Mudder challenges since the pandemic happened. And my five-year-old, we've made like mini versions for him and he's so incredibly excited about them. And it's really, really cute to see him get excited and do some of the activities with us and, yeah. and stuff like that. So that, and then that's been, it's nice. It's a nice way to kind of use my body and do something very different from the academic and the clinical world. And, and I love that. And probably the other big thing is I'm, I'm a very, very, very voracious reader. So I'm always reading something I challenge myself to read at least 30 books a year, but it's often more than that. And I just love, love, love to read. So, but I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I've got my two little boys, a three and a five-year-old, and um, they keep me very busy. I really love being their mom, <laughs> and um, which is really a, a delightful thing. I've, I've kind of delighted in discovering who I am as a mother and and um, how fun it is to kind of see the world again through like fresh sets of eyes, watching them discover things and watching them get interested or affected by things. You know, even if, even when they're sad or even when they're upset or angry about something, kind of watching their process as they they interact with the world. And it's it's it gives me like a, a new freshness, and I, I really I really really relish in that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else that you would add about yourself? Any particular values that you adhere to or passions of yours? Uh, values. 
so I was talking about this recently with a friend and something that is really lovely for me. I, the context is, is my grandfather actually passed away about six weeks ago. Um, mm, so and beautiful. thank you. And um, he was a really, both of my grandparents, that set of grandparents were really, really important in my life. Um, I even lived with them for a while. So they weren't, they weren't distant, they weren't adjunct, they were very core in my life. And, you know, we were talking about how both of them lived a really good life, you know, and really um, gave back to the community and really cared about people. And, you know, I said, one of the things that I'm really happy was if, if my, my number comes up tomorrow, I can know that I've lived a good life. You know, I can, I know that I haven't harmed and regretted harm or at least not intentionally harmed. I mean, I think we all unintentionally harm. That's part of being human, but you know, so in terms of values, I think it's just really important to, I wish I had better language for this, but to be nice, not to be a pushover, not to be a doormat, but to, to be kind. And, um, you know, I, my, I, you know, I have good boundaries, but I think it's, it's important to um, not do something that you end up not being able to look at yourself in the mirror for. So I, I think I have a value of kindness and a value of inclusion. And I think that's really core to me as, as who I am as a person. And, you know, whether or not I always meet that mark, you know, life happens, but I, I know that it's, it's a driving force to have a, a really strong moral compass of, of kindness. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question would be, what comes to mind as an event in your life or a set of circumstances um, that has shaped or influenced who you are? Okay, so I know we're doing a Gestalt interview, so I'm not trying to play <laughs> to the interview. <laughs> but um, probably, probably one of the single biggest catalysts that I've had in my life was taking the Gestalt class in my doctorate program. Um, and I say that, it's funny, I just got chills as I'm thinking about it. Um, I, I say it because it's not just a professional shift. It was such a shift to who I am as a human. Um, I feel like Gestalt isn't just a therapy. It really is a way of being. It really is um, a way of interacting in the world differently. And mm -hmm. I would say taking that class of my instructor was uh, Todd Burley. And he um, uh, owns Gestalt Associates Training Los Angeles with uh, Bob and Rita Resnick for a long time and, and Liv Estrup. And, and um, he taught this class and I remember being like, wow, this is great. This is my, my Cinderella shoe. Like I found, this is what I want to be as a therapist. I take another classes and they were fine. Like I, I learned mm -hmm. great things and I value those things, but something about him and the theory and watching the live demonstrations just said, oh, this, this is why I'm going through the tortures of hell to get this doctorate program. <laughs> this is what it's for. And um, after the class ended, it was just like, oh, that's a great thing. I, great thing in my tool belt. And then not too long afterwards, I get this email from Rita Resnick saying, hey, I got your name from Todd Burley and uh, we think you'd be a great fit for our program. Would you ever want to train with us? Or something, something like that. And it, it actually freaked me out a little bit because I felt very seen. <laughs> you know? Like I didn't know I had stood out. I didn't know, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that I stood out enough for him to make that recommendation. So it felt very um, like a huge compliment, but also very scary. So the, the email sat in my inbox for probably about two months before I responded to it. And then I, I said, yeah, let's give this a shot. And they were lovely and accommodating and able to give a poor student like me a scholarship and it's been over 10 years and I'm still with Gatlas. So something, something really important happened. So I would say that was a very, very important um, interaction point in my life because it really changed the trajectory of, of everything, you mm -hmm. know, and what I learned about myself through doing Gestalt work changed my interactions with my family changed my, my family of origin, changed my interactions with the type of therapy I thought it was going to be doing, changed my communication with my husband. E everything changed after, mm -hmm. after that introduction. So. so do you want to say a bit more about how Gestalt over the year, just in that, in that first interaction, has affected you as a person? I mean, you say changed, but as I have no references, I don't know from what to what. Yeah, that's true. Um, 
Yes. So I, I um, tended to be very, very unsure of myself. Um, very, how do I put this? Um, uh, had a, had a lot of kind of, um, not a sense of my abilities or my worth, a lot of imposter syndrome, a lot of, um, not good enoughness, a lot mm -hmm. of, um, you know, almost like, like a lot of things, oh, I got into the program because I was lucky or you know, like, like a lot of these kind of attributions of, of, um, I have the things I have out of luck kind of situation and earn them or, or, and I know through some of the work that was done in the practice and then some of what I was watching other people, so many other people going through this prestigious doctorate program had the same concerns about their worth and the same, um, insecurities and and i was like oh okay i'm not the only one who feels this way because it's these a are prerequisite all actually for most doctoral programs all of us feeling very impostery yeah. <laughs> good that i fit in totally fine but um yeah so i think watching some of these other people and then watching um todd burley do the work it was almost it was almost like he like unscrewed somebody's head and like pushed a couple buttons, put it back on. And all of a sudden people were like awake. <laughs> it was just oh. amazing to watch him do the work. And I was like, I want that. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to feel that, you know, mm -hmm. as, like, as a client. So, you know, and, and not that insecurity doesn't still happen. Of course it does. You know, there's still all the human emotions of shame and embarrassment, all these things that come up. But now I feel like when they show up, it's, it's like, it's a, Hey buddy, how you doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> rather than it being something that I have to be um, cowed by. So it's, it's a hard question to answer. I hope I did okay with that, but it's, it, I, there's a very distinct before and after for me of um, my place in the world, you know, feeling mm -hmm. like I have something to offer, mm -hmm. which is nice. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if you would like to speak on a more personal level about um, any other set of circumstances in your life that have sort of defined who you are in the sense of the person who came into Gestalt or the person who lives in Gestalt. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us have cultural and trans transgenerational and all kinds of different makeups. Yeah, and yeah. Just even, you know, good old childhood traumas or whatever. <laughs> but not, not necessarily like the painful things, but sure. just... I, I, I think speaking, speaking generally about it, I'd be okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, details, maybe not as much, but some general stuff, but it's, it's, you know, the, my family structure changed, my family of origin structure changed a lot uh, growing up. So um, divorces and remarriages move, move um, geographical moves to different states in the United States. So living different places, having to start over again, make new friends again, having a different makeup of a family unit not once, but a couple of times. So there was a lot of um, uh, restarts and some of them were good and some of them were not good, you know, and just like in any other family system, some of the relationships are really strong and some of them are not very strong. So I, I know I was impacted by navigating all of those, those changes. Um, you know, I, I do come from a Jewish background and we can talk about transgenerational trauma a lot with the Jewish culture. Um, so, you know, I, I do think some of that stereotypical Jewish neuroticism was part of my upbringing and maybe part of me. Um, and <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think that there was a lot of adversity to overcome. And some of the places that I lived um, were pretty homogenous and not very kind and open. So I did face some discrimination coming from a Jewish background in some of the places that I lived. Um, so, you know, you know, I think again, anybody who doesn't fit the, the stereotypical white Christian male in this country has some experience in the United States, has some experience with some discrimination. So, you know, I certainly had, had my moments. Um, and, and I, and I do think all of those things affected my attachment style and affected my, um, how I transition into new settings and things like that. And, and I don't think starting graduate school was much different. I think there was still a lot of the uncertainty and a lot of the um, typical insecurities that may come from where, now who am I and what is my place in this setting? Mm -hmm. so, and 
I guess to, to, to put that more specifically, specifically with Gestalt, both in that class and then training at the Institute, was uh, people get to really see you at your most stripped down. <laughs> like, you know, we do the live work with each other in the training. So the groups that I've been in have seen me at my absolute most stripped down. And for some reason, they still liked me. <laughs> that, that was really healing. And I think that's something that my mentor um, really gave me as a gift of even when you see me warts and all is the phrase, like when you see me and all of my crazies, um, they still valued me. And I think that that was like an extremely healing experience in my life. Having mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And when you say your mentor, I mean, that's, that's another question that we have is if there is a person in your life who has particularly influenced you. And I don't know if that, is that the mentor? Is that Todd? Is that someone else you'd like to mention? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, can you maybe say a bit about, you know, how that person, you know, changed you or influenced you? Yes. Well, I know that there's got to be a time limit on the interview. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so, um, so Todd is definitely the person that I, I um, consider my big mentor. Um, and uh, so he, he's, he's, passed away now. He's, he's died a couple of years ago and it was a pretty, pretty big loss for a whole community. But he, he, um, you know, there's kind professors who want to help you or who give you suggestions and things, but I felt like he really saw us, the mm. students. Um, and it's interesting because he's probably one of the most influential people in my entire life. Um, I actually, I actually named my son. Um, my son's middle name shares his middle name. So I, I named my, I found out I was pregnant um, right after he passed away. So, oh. you know, it made sense for me to, um, to, to want to, it's part of Jewish tradition to take the name of people who were influential in your life who've passed mm. and either give a letter of that name or the name itself to your children. So it's a way of kind of you know, hoping your children have those people's attributes. So it's actually a nice little cultural follow through, but. So where does your name come from? My name, my name comes from, um, so I, I had a, there's, I can't remember exactly who it is, but I know I had a grandparent with an S. Okay. <laughs> so they use, they use the S, but it's funny now that I think about it, my family didn't really share the story and kind of keep that person in my life because I can't, can't tell you who they are, but <laughs> You know, but I talked to my son <laughs> about mm -hmm. why he was named, what he's named. And actually both of my kids are named after, you know, loved ones that have passed. So, but we've, we've kind of kept those stories alive for them and they know who they are and as much as a three and a five year old can. But, mm -hmm. but in my case, the, in, I know Todd did for many, many students what he did for me. Um, you know, I know that he was so beloved by so many people. Um, and again, like at least my experiences, I felt like he really saw me um, and saw the value and the potential. And, and, and it wasn't, you know, <laughs> he had a way of even when he needed to say something critical to you to say it, you know, with, with humor and kindness, but let you know, let you know what you needed to do. Okay, so you <laughs> and, and you I did get that, the message, but... Yeah, yeah, get the message. Exactly. And I, and I appreciated that. Like, I really like somebody being able to kind of give me both. Like, here's what you need to do better. Mm -hmm. Here's where you've done well. And he was really great at that. And um, so after the class, he brought me into Gatla and he trained me in Gatla with the other lovely people there. And um, the year I was graduating, we decided to do a, a, an official mentorship relationship as a psych assistant mm -hmm. in his private practice. And we signed all the documents and everything was great. And then he got a, a terminal diagnosis and we navigated that, you know, the, mm. you know, that whole time. And so we, he made sure, even then he made sure that he could mentor me when he could. And mm -hmm. then he uh, made arrangements so that another psychologist could uh, make sure that she was mentoring me and tracking my hours so that my, my um, hours were protected. Wow. So... And it, but even you know, he, I just remember we had this meeting, the first meeting after his diagnosis, you know, I said to him, if you don't want to do this arrangement anymore, I understand you may want to spend this time with your family. You may want to do that. And he said to me, he's like, this is what I want to do. Mm. I can let go of some of these writings. I can let go of some of this. I will do this and I will do a couple of other things, but this, this is something I still want to do. Um, 
And then he says to me, and this is, this is again, so lovely from the Gestalt framework is, but if this is going to be too difficult for you, I understand and there's no hard feelings. Mm -hmm. So he even took, like, he even took care of me in that moment of if watching me be sick, if, you know, being with me during my journey is going to be too hard for you. It's okay if you don't want to do this anymore. Wow. So like, it's just such a kind, you know, very thoughtful, um, thing to offer and but you know for for me and the handful of other former students that he was uh, working with at the time he still met with us there was a research team that we were working together on some articles to publish and he still met with us when he could and he was still active in our lives and asked us how we were doing and all of that stuff and it was a really um it was a really influential relationship and of just um, what real kind of kindness and mentorship looks like. Mm. So I think because of him, I really, I really kind of draw a lot of my values. He's really modeled what a good mentor looks like. And I hope, I hope I do some of that for the people that I supervise. I mean, Cause even if I do a fraction of that, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that if you're putting this much into it, it's most definitely coming from the heart and will probably come through. So hope so. <laughs> I do yeah. love them. I do love them. <laughs> but but I've, I've had other, I've had other good, good people in my life too. But I think that that's like, that's the big pivot. You know, my grandparents, mm -hmm. which I mentioned earlier, particularly mm -hmm. my grandmother, mm -hmm. you know, influential. Just mm -hmm. um, most, most of the people in my nuclear family are men, lots and lots mm -hmm. of men. So she was kind of um, like the matriarch. And so she, <laughs> She and I had our moments where we kind of would give each other side eye every once in a while <laughs> when there was a very masculine things happening or very patriarchal things happening in the family. And, and it was just nice. I felt like she was my buddy. You know, she was my buddy um, in a place where I consistently felt different. So, yeah. hmm. Well, that's, that's actually another question um, that some people choose not to answer because it's not particularly how they define or identify themselves. Um, but the question is how you experience yourself within your gender or as a woman or in your femininity. That's a good question. Hmm. It feels like one that, that, that should have a thoughtful answer. So I don't want to kind of rush with it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I know, I know that I'm cisgendered female. You know, so I do claim being a woman. Um, and there are things about being a woman that I really like. Um, and I feel like, whether intentionally or not intentionally, how I grew up, uh, being female was pejorated. You know, it was negative. Um, okay. Less than, you know, something. And again, it wasn't always explicitly stated, but it, it just, I could see it, you know, and, 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 treatment and, and resources and, um, you know, and I'm not just talking in my immediate life, you know, you, you can just see kind of systemic mm -hmm. inequities. Right. So, um, you know, I, I do have a sense of, of my gender sometimes having cost me or made it harder for me to do some things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have a very exuberant personality. I don't know if it's come across in the <laughs> it, it, Yeah, I can start to see some glimmers of that. <laughs> I, um, I was sitting there when you were describing being surprised at having been seen in the class. I was like, um, no, I, I think you'd be one of those kind of like, because you just light up. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very nice feedback. Thank you. <laughs> but you know how we see ourselves and how others see us can often be different, you know. Mm -hmm. um, very true. Yeah, but I, I find- According and, to you, no one's noticing you, right? <laughs> <laughs> or the fear of I wouldn't stand out. I don't know. I mean, again, it's, it's all of our, uh, um, our uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like our, uh, our uh, creative adjustments, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, exactly. So, um, you know, what, what, what may have been true there, not always true later, but, and, and I've, I've definitely kind of stepped into myself more after having done all this work and- Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm a lot more comfortable now than I was before. But um, if, if you know anything about the Myers-Briggs, you know, my Myers-Briggs is ENFJ. And these are very 
like extroverted, very like personal relationship kind of people. And it, it very, very fits me. Um, whether you like Myers-Briggs or not, it, for me, it fits, fits me very well. And, you know, I feel like the, the attributes of an ENFJ or the way that I am tend to be more valued in men than they are in women. And, and I've, I've seen that in some ways, you know, um, sometimes my, oh, we should do this or we should try this is like, just, just quiet down or, or pull back a little bit or you're too much. You know, I've heard a lot of that throughout my entire life is you're, you're too much or, you know, you need to calm down or yeah, really the intensity. Down. Yeah, you're too intense. And I, and I have gotten that on and on. And I can see the same, literally maybe the same idea we propose from like a male counterpart. And that's a great idea. And I'm like, <laughs> did you not hear me say that? So I, I've had, I think I've had moments like that where I'm just aware of, and there's sadness that comes along with that. There's sadness that comes along with that. And, and there's, there's been enough examples that share that it, they're not flukes, that there's something systemic in, in the, the femaleness representation of kind of my... Um, exuberance or my entrepreneurship and, and things like that. And, and um, you know, it hasn't stopped me. It just feels bad sometimes. So mm-hmm. I own my own company, you know, and, and I, and I'm a teacher and I, you know, I'm a professor. So all these things are, you know, roles of power. So I've done the things, but sometimes it hurts when I'm underestimated. Mm-hmm. And you've done them and I'm assuming you're under 50. So I am under 50. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's interesting. I've been asking a lot of people as well. It sort of comes up as, you know, how are you living your age is another question we hadn't initially thought of, but I mean, a lot of people start to realize their age, I think, as they get into their sixties and seventies. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you notice anything about your age at this point in your life and how you I are think, in it. Yeah, I think about my age a lot, actually. It's a good question. Um, so so currently at the time of this interview, I'm 36. I'm happy. It's, it's okay for me to say that. I'm fine with my age. <laughs> it's fine. Um, if anything, sometimes I, I worry about how I might be underestimated because of my, my age. Um, you know, I, I have employees who are older than I am. And I have students who are older than I am. I've also been a professor now for five or six years. So I've consistently had students who are older than I am. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll have clients who are young or who are older and they come in and we have to have that, that discussion. You know, mm-hmm. what are you going to know about my life kind of situation? And, and they have a right to ask that. You know, and I don't, think I, I don't think I have to sell them. I, have to, I, I can't know about your life. You can know about your life. But I can, I can help you with process, essentially. So... Um, you know, I, I feel like I've been trained how to handle that pretty gracefully. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, there was a lot of conversations about when to have children mm. uh, in terms of where in, in the professional um, journey to have them because I, I knew I wanted to be a mother and, and thankfully I've been able to be a mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, of parents who had their kids younger. There's a lot of parents who are having their kids older. You know, I had my kids at, at um, 31 and 33, which to me felt felt like the right time for us. Uh, and as I get older, I realize that there's more things I want to do, but time time doesn't stop. <laughs> so I have, to, I've, I have to narrow down my focus a little bit. You know, I get really excited about a lot of things mm-hmm. and you know, I don't have all the time and energy in the world to do all the things that, that, you know, bring me joy. <laughs> so, and, and also make sure that I'm, you know, very, very present for my children. So I think I'm, I'm aware of age in that context too, of when you pick something, you say no to something else. When you say no to yes. something else, there's room, right? So I, I do think that that plays into it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I, when I learned about that stuff in quantum physics, about the way, you know, that universal potential exists, and then when something is defined, all of those potential universes disappear and cease to be, I cried. I was like, oh my God, that's the saddest thing I've ever heard. Potential dies yes. when something is defined. That was horrible. That was, it was really traumatic. So I don't recommend quantum physics anymore. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So another question for you is, 
and I've heard a bit about, you know, how you got into Gestalt and sort of the training that you did, but I'm wondering what it is that specifically stands out as the thing that captivates you or keeps your attention or attracts you within Gestalt. I think the authenticity of this method, this um, way of practicing is so powerful. Um, and I don't see it with a lot of other therapies. Not that therapists can't be authentic, but I feel like there's so much permission to show up as who you are and that your phenomenology is, is valuable in the room too. You know, I love the idea of, of um, you know, um, creating difference at a contact boundary, right? Between myself and the, and the client, right? And I, I like that idea of um, really being authentic and present in the room as I am. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, I get that question a lot from students where I'm like, that doesn't mean you're telling your client your stories and you're not you know, disclosing yourself to your client, but you get to be impacted by your client. You can tell them what it's like to be with them in the room. And when I model this for my students, they're all, oh, can we do that? Oh my gosh. Yeah, you get you know, to be in the room too. To, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you can be affected and you can share that impact. And when you share that impact, how for most clients, it deepens the work and it brings them in more. And that real authentic way of being that very, you know, I, thou dialogue where, you know, there's no agenda other than to be what's between us. Like that is, that's just like, that's the magic. It's so um, fulfilling and oh, gorgeous. Like, I don't know how else to put it. I love, love that part of this. Hmm. So, um, and kind of to build onto that, that's, I feel like paradoxical change is part of that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the, so I feel like paradoxical theory of change is part of that because again, it's it's where am I now and what's what's my truth now? Not all this I should be over there, but what is true for me now? I love that idea of um, being very present with where you are or with the client, you know, where they are. So I, I really I, I you know something about giving permission to be you is very powerful. You know, and not just for me as, as the therapist, obviously, but for the client and them learning how to give themselves permission to be themselves or to know, you know, where they are and who they are. It's, it's the whole authentic presence kind of breeds more authentic presence. An yeah. interesting affectation that happens there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking, you know, I, I really don't think anyone could do humans of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just don't think that they'd be quite as available as people to do this kind of <laughs> conversation. I agree. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's that's obviously one of the things that I most appreciate, and that's the reason that I'm doing this, is because I'm curious about the people and interested in having them be more present. So I'm glad that uh, that also resonates with you. So another question that I have is whether you consider yourself to be part of a Gestalt community, whether that phrase means anything to you. Absolutely. And um, I'm so in love with the community that I'm part of. Like I wouldn't, you know, we, we had the idea, my husband and I were, should we, sh should we move somewhere else than Southern California? Because I don't think either of us are in love with Southern California. Um, but the Gestalt community here was a decide that was a factor in our decision to stay. Um, so very much so. Not that I couldn't fly in for trainings people do, but that's, so I belong to, to GATLA, Gestalt Associates Training Los Angeles. Um, and they've been amazing. And it doesn't just feel like a training program. I mean, it, it very much is a community. And the friends that I've made through Gestalt training like there's a quality of the friendship that again is that very deep authentic quality even if we're not in each other's lives all the time you know even if we don't go out and do things together although i certainly do with some of them um there's a connection like again these are the people that have seen me warts and all and i've seen them warts and all and we really deeply care about each other so i do i've done three of the residential programs mm -hmm. um I stopped the last one I did, I was pregnant with my, my oldest. So I, I haven't gone back yet. Although um, my plan is to go back 
assuming the world opens up again and safe to do so, my plan is to go back in the next year or two, now that my kids are a little bit older and, and mm -hmm. make some arrangements. But um, so even the greater international Gestalt community, I feel I belong to, and I have dear friends who, again, I might not talk to all the time, but when we do talk, it's just like, oh, you, and it's like we connect and, you know, one of them's in Poland and one of them's in Croatia and like all these like lovely places and, you know, Canada mm -hmm. and, and, and when I see them, my face lights up and their face lights up and there's just like, there's just a knowing, I feel like when we, when we reconnect despite time in circumstance. So yes. Well, I mean, you you say there's a knowing, but also when you've trained together and it's not just seeing the wards, but in, in most Gestalt programs now, it's actually a basic expectation that you will have worked on your relationships. And so it's not like you haven't developed anything with those specific people. It's just kind of comes to mind as I was listening to you. I mean, maybe I'm just saying something obvious, but no, I, I think that's, I think you have a wonderful point. You know, you're like right. If you, if you go to, you know, biology postgraduate, I mean, you're working together, but you're not working on your relationship. And I think psychotherapy training, especially Gestalt, is much more actually about understanding how you are with those people. So. Uh, absolutely. Well, especially when you train, because again, I've been fortunate enough to, for various reasons and, and circumstances, I've been able to train for a decade, over a decade now with the same lovely group of people. And, you know, watching even group process in the training has taught me how to, to better handle difficult situations uh, and within this like supportive environment. So even if there's, even if there's a um, disagreement that happens in group process that can get very heated, um, you know, it, the whole thing is, well, let's let the group process happen, but it's, it's um, cushioned and nurtured. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's like learning how to navigate some of the more difficult parts of human interaction. And, and, mm -hmm. and then you're still with those people years later, and then you can laugh about that horrible thing that happened five years ago or whatever it was. And so I really, you know, these are, these are my, um, these are my buddies. These are, I wish I had a better analogy, but they're kind of like my combat buddies and, you know, that's true in ways. And yeah, and I am I'm, I'm very grateful. And, and this last year, um, I acted as a, as a group leader in the program, meaning that I'm no longer a trainer or no longer a, a trainee. I'm not a student. Um, I'm not one of the trainers, but I'm, I'm with a group for the entire year. And I, I do some of the training and some of the supervision and stuff. So it's, it's, it's a different role and um, it's more, again, more of the, more of a training role than it is a, a learning role. And it's, it's right. a really interesting way to kind of change that perspective a little bit and mm -hmm. watching more work and, and, you know, kind of fine tuning the craft that way now. Yeah. I think it's just a different level of a learning role, honestly. <laughs> it's, it really is. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So I'm wondering, maybe in the training, maybe in different aspects, but what would you say are some of the most significant challenges that you've run up against? Specifically in the Gestalt world or in, in life? Um, you can either answer that as a person or as a Gestalt person, however you'd like. I mean, some people have clinical challenges, you know, maybe you got stuck in a muddy obstacle or something. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that has definitely happened. You know, I should say running the obstacle races sounds impressive, but I am awkward. <laughs> and it, it doesn't sound glamorous. I, I can't imagine it being glamorous. It is not. Well, actually, what's funny, I think what, what actually attracts me to, I'll answer the question in a minute, but what, what attracts me to um, the obstacle races is similar to what attracts me to Gestalt is like, it's bumbly, it's messy, but we all help each other. And it's, you know, the, it's very collab. Well, the, the ones that I run, it's called Tough Mudder. The ones that I run are, are collaborative. They're not competitive. So the oh, idea okay. is you help your fellow mudder through the course. And oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. Like, you know, I wish we could all kumbaya get along and help each other out. <laughs> that's yeah, I was kind of imagining like Navy SEALs kind of, <laughs> you know, dunking each other's head in the mud puddles. I mean, that does but it's not be. bad. <laughs> but it's done in a friendly way. But oh, yeah. okay. Great. <laughs> friendly mud dunkings, yes. But okay. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I think, I think there's, been a, there's been a lot of obstacles. Uh, you know, I'm start, starting 
starting my own company is, is an obstacle. I, I was never trained with a business mind. So it was a lot of troubleshooting and, and asking a lot of questions and feeling very out of my depth many, many times. And, um, you know, I think in each new role, even though I'm really excited to get to that role, as I take the role, there's a lot of um, initial buyer's remorse of, did I take so much more than I could chew? Um, and feeling very insecure and, and just hoping that things will play out. Um, so I know starting the company was learning uh, how, what protections do you need in terms of insurances and, um, you know, what, uh, what do you need to do financially in case, I don't know, the world shuts down with a global pandemic and like, what, like how, how do you, how do you do that? And, um, you know, there were some, there's some stumblings obviously in the beginning and sometimes I would see just enough clients to be able to cover the expenses, but not really pay myself. And, yeah. and there were some real, real skinny years there in the beginning. Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to belong to a partnership where there's two incomes. So, um, and, and a lot of support from my husband. He's really, um, a really, really amazing person and really supportive. And obviously he, you know, is an amazing parent to our kids. So like, okay, we got another Gatla weekend. I got the boys, go, go do what you need to do. And, and so I, I I know that a big reason why a lot of these things could happen is because I have this really strong partnership, um, especially since he carried the brunt of things for a while while all of this was starting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, I think a lot of the, the adversity is, is kind of the typical adversity that a lot of people experience, you know, losses that I've had and, um, you know, plans that you make that, that don't quite follow through the way that you hoped they would. and you know, uh, relationships that you start with people professional that don't work out. Um, thankfully in the Gestalt world, it's been pretty solid and supportive. Um, and, uh, but overall I've been, I think I've been pretty fortunate and I'm pretty stubborn when it comes to trying to make things happen. And even though it was really hard, I'm pretty happy where I am now. So another question, sort of about that happy where you are, I guess, would be what comes to mind as one of your greatest moments? I mean, one of your most fulfilling kind of experiences, either within Gestalt or outside? Uh, the memory that came to mind is, is not, has nothing to do with therapy. Um, when I was younger, um, I needed, I needed to, I needed to have my own identity. And, um, I decided come hell or high water that I was going to go live in Australia. <laughs> okay. And, and it was just something I always wanted to do. And, you know, I applied for a study abroad program when I was an undergraduate. Um, I got accepted. I got a scholarship. Um, I did have some help from these, the grandparents I was mentioning before. They're always really supportive of my academics and, and stuff. And I remember a friend of mine took me to this, uh, I don't even know what to call it, like a, like a cove where it was a private neighborhood, but from that cove, you could see the, um, the Bay Bridge and the Sydney Opera House, and you could see the whole harbor, but it was a private, so it wasn't like the middle of like it's crazy. Not the, the public view, right? Yeah. It was a, yeah. And that wasn't the public view. And um, my friend had her friend blindfolded me and walked me down these stairs. I had no idea where I was going, nothing. And then they, they pulled off the blindfold and there it was. And I remember just sobbing. I was like, I'm here. I made it here. Whoa. I didn't even live in Sydney. I lived in Melbourne for the year. But, <laughs> but, but there was still something about like the iconic view that I was looking at was um, like, I made this happen. You know, I had this big dream and I filled out the paperwork and I, you know, I, I dealt with all the naysaying and all that kind of stuff and, and, and I made it. And I think that moment um, gave me a little bit more confidence to keep making more decisions to risk and to follow through. But yeah, that's, I, that's the first thing that came to mind was that, that memory. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. I mean, it's actually being able to propel yourself to the other side of the world. Kind of sounds like with a lot of willpower behind it. A lot. Well, well, stubborn. <laughs> but yeah, but it was good. 
Yeah, it was, yeah. All right, I'm, I'll take away that stubborn. I'm going to say tenacious and- Okay. Yeah. No, I wasn't saying any of that. I just said there was a lot of willpower that propelled yeah. you across the world, so. No, no, no. Well, I was actually realizing we were talking a little bit, I think stubborn was an interject. I think stubborn was, you know, again, a way that it could be looked at negatively, but I don't right. feel negative about it. I feel really positive about it. So I would say, mm -hmm. for me, tenacity is a, a, a good correction for what that felt like. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the last thing that I would actually ask you is um, what's next? I mean, you obviously hopefully have quite a number of years ahead of you. So what project would you see for yourself? And on the other hand, what do you think is next for Gestalt? So personally, um, I would like to grow this company that I've started. Um, I'd like to do more training. I love it. Um, and we've even talked about, so I, I didn't talk about this before, but my clinical love is trauma. Um, and I'm a trauma therapist and um, have a bunch of training in other trauma therapies that fit really well with Gestalt. That's what I love about Gestalt is I feel like it, it can kind of sit on top of a lot of other things. Like, it's really nice. So I have a, a dream and the beginnings of these seeds are starting. I don't want to say too much because it's so in its infancy, but I were possibly down the line might open a full um, trauma treatment center and possibly dual diagnosis with substance abuse because one of my, my colleagues that works with me is a um, substance abuse counselor. Very, very uh, um, experienced, very good. And she also trains at Gala. She's also a Gestalt therapist. Um, so we've talked about this little dream and we might, let that, we might let that play out a little bit. And I love that idea. I love this holistic treatment of trauma, um, body therapy, somatic therapies, and which again pairs so nicely with Gestalt and trained in EMDR, I'm trained in EFT tapping and all these other kind of weird little adjunct therapies that are really useful. So for me, I would like to kind of have a one-stop trauma treatment shop <laughs> in the future. When you, when you say that, I just keep hearing the song um, by Pink called Beautiful Trauma. I don't know yeah. if you've heard that one. I love her. Loving, She's loving trauma. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's just, I feel like, I feel like um, trauma really is its own, it's its own thing to treat. I mean, it's so, it's so specialized in a lot of ways and it can't be treated with just like typical talk therapy. It really has to be experiential and very interested in, in how our nervous system works and how our nervous system, um, I get really geeky about the neurophysiology of this stuff. So I won't, I won't do it in the interview, but um, I really, really appreciate no, but it. It's exciting that people are getting geeky about interpersonal neurobiology and trauma neurobiology. Yeah. Because if we weren't getting geeky about that, we just keep, you know, smearing the wrong thing on the problem. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. there, there are limitations. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited that that is, you know, something that you can geek out on. Yeah. Super geek out on it. I, I, there's actually a public speaking bit that I've done about why process-based therapies work better for trauma than some of the other traditional therapies. And I have a whole, I've done, I've done it as a, um, like a guest speaker in clinics and stuff before, but it's, I talk about how to work with the right brain, like right brain functioning mm -hmm. versus left brain functioning. And right. um, if the sympathetic nervous system gets triggered, fight, flight, or freeze, how do we activate the parasympathetic? And, mm -hmm. but not in a way to just calm the body down, but so that the body learns to, to adaptively use the parasympathetic nervous system. So I, I love, 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 love that stuff. And I would love well, to- What I think is fascinating is working with clients about trauma and letting them become aware when those shifts happen. I mean, it's, it's the difference between going from an automatic transmission to a standard and, and letting the person learn how to manage their own shifts. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's um, uh, a phrase that stands out to me is we have a very strange job where the purpose of our job is to get our clients to fire us. And yeah, Redu redundancy is designed into the package. Yes, exactly. And, you know, that's why, because my whole thing is I would love to teach you um, your owner's manual. I would love for you to have the owner's manual for, for how you work so that when it happens, because things happen, but when it mm -hmm. happens, how do you, you know, intervene quicker or more effectively and and I, and I love that idea. And I think with trauma, it's how do you notice in the moment what's happening in your body? How do you interact with it effectively? And how are you kind to yourself? Because 
these reactions are, are automatic. Nobody's choosing to get triggered. So, you know, so kind of teaching them again to, to reclaim their body. So it's, it's really lovely work. So that's, that's my, that's my fantasy down the line um, with what I'd like to do in terms of my professional career. And um, personally, you know, I, I have a lot of wonderful ideas for things I'd like to show my kids and uh, experiences I'd like them to have when the world opens up again. And for the field of Gestalt, you know, it's, it's such a comprehensive way of working. You know, I, I, I wish it was more in the forefront of therapy. You know, I wish, because at least in the United States, it's CBT everything, DBT everything. Some of these somatic therapies are getting a little bit more um, attention now. Um, and, you know, I know emotion-focused therapy gets get some attention and emotion focused therapy comes from gestalt therapy. And I teach emotion focused therapy actually. And, and I teach my students, I'm like, they're fraternal twins. Like they're, you know, they're, they're so, so closely related. And um, so I, I do think that more people are learning process-based therapies, but I wish, um, I wish gestalt got the same kind of attention and, and funding for research and things that some of these other therapies have. Um, so, you know, again, even this project that you're doing, I think is really helpful because it makes it more accessible. I think one of Gestalt's biggest problems is most people don't know what it is. They don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> they don't mm. know how to describe it. And yeah. yeah. yeah they, don't, they don't have a flavor of, you know, what, it, what, it, what it's like. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to add? Anything we've left out here? I, 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 you know, I'm sure once we hit end, I will, <laughs> I will think of something, but you know, I do, I, I think I just, I want to give a shout out. I'm so grateful for the, the, the people who have really nurtured me in this world. So I talked a lot about Todd because he was my introduction, but you know, the people that I've known at Gatla for many years have been really helpful. So Bob and Rita Resnick um, really um, have been, again, so welcoming and so inclusive and I feel like I have a really um, lovely relationship with Liv Estrup, who's another one of these wonderful, I don't know if you know her, but she's just yeah, like- she's, She is dear. She's a beautiful human being. Beautiful human being. I just I, like, oh, and she's so creative and <laughs> like has all these amazing, like cool stories. And, yeah. and you know, and, and you know, she and I've worked on a couple of things together. We've um, have some very similar interests. We actually recommend books to each other. So it, it's, and, and, and I think that's what I love about actually, yes, something I would add this community. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity. It doesn't, you know, live, live is, you know, in her seventies, I'm in my thirties and I, I don't, I don't feel like it, you know, I feel like there's respect for that, but I don't feel like there's, um, I don't feel like it matters in the connection. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I, I think that that's something I've loved is you, the new folks who are coming in who are younger than I am. It's welcome to the club. You know, the people who have been there for decades and decades and, you know, I can have a really lovely close connection and the, all these differences in, in terms of who we are and where we come from, you know, I've become good friends with, again, people in, in Poland and, and people from Kyrgyzstan and like all these amazing places. And it's just, it's just wonderful. So I just want to give a shout out to the community and all these people who've been a part of my journey. And I think that's all I would add. Well, thank you. It's been uh, lovely. And if it's okay with you, we will leave it here. Absolutely. Thank you.